This episode is brought to you in part by Candorel. Coming soon, a luxury master plant condominium community rising at the corner of Bathurst and St. Clair. Situated directly on the subway and streetcar line, a monument of architecture and interior design, a timeless expression of glamour and grace. Forêt Forest Hill. Register today at live at forêt.ca. That's live at f-o-r-e-t dot c-a. Shalom! Welcome to Rivkush, a CJM podcast featuring conversations with Jews of color discussing all things Jewish. Today I am so pleased to welcome Michael Twitty. Our paths cross actually fairly often considering we live in two different countries. He is super cool. So let me tell you a little bit about Michael. Michael is a culinary historian and food writer from the Washington, D.C. area. He blogs at afroculinaria.com. He's appeared on Bizarre Foods America with Andrew Zimmern, Many Rivers to Cross with Henry Louis Gates, and Taste the Nation with Padma Lakshmi. His book, The Cooking Gene, was released in 2017, and the book traced his ancestry through food from Africa to America, and from slavery to freedom. Michael was a finalist for the Kirkus Prize and the Art of Eating Prize and a third place winner of the Barnes & Noble Discover New Writers Awards for Nonfiction. That was a mouthful. The Cooking Gene also won the 2018 James Beard Award for Best Writing as well as Book of the Year. That made him the first black author so awarded. Woohoo! His book, Kosher Soul, is the follow up to The Cooking Gene, and it will be out in August of this year, 2022. And may I encourage you, because I'm doing it myself, I need to know you need to do this. You need to pre order the book. You will not be disappointed, and you'll have something, something to look forward to. You'll be watching out for August when it's released, either in Kindle, hardcover, whatever version it comes in. You need to order it. Michael also has, and this I didn't know, Michael, that you have a hit spice line based on the cooking gene, but is part of it, um, you know, you have your spices, and I think every black kitchen has that Laurie's, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Can't shake that. (laughs) Oh, gosh. So welcome, Michael. You know, this is so cool for me. And, you know, every time we like we happen to be at the same panel or whatever, I just I appreciate you. I enjoy speaking with you. I think from the first time I met you many years ago, and it was right before you won the James Beard, and I picked you up at the airport. I think I loved you then. I loved you then. (laughs) (laughs) It was like instant. So, so welcome. So happy to have you you here. So I'm just, I want to turn to something because um, it's, 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 it's heavy in the air. Um, I can't stop thinking about it. My heart is hurting. And it's what's going on in the United States and the um, the shooting in Buffalo. Uh, I don't even know. I don't even know how to process it, Michael. So you just can you share some of your thoughts on what the heck? Well, we have a <clears throat> the current issue at the Supreme Court over um, women's choice, etc., is directly tied to a movement on the part of white evangelicals that began right after integration. And the so-called, you know, dissolving and de-evolution of America was not a consequence of black freedom struggle or a revolution. It was a reaction, a manufactured reaction. And so one of the the key points um, since the late 60s, early 70s has been the so-called Great Replacement Theory, which says that, you know, Western societies will fall into chaos if they don't have white majorities. And one of the number one enemies of that white majority system supposedly is the lack of high birth rate among white women. So how do you counter that? You find strategies that reduce 
black and brown populations and uplift white ones. Um, the shooter, who is only 18 years old, he's still an adult I, sorry, in the system. I, I, sorry, I still can't even get over that, eh? Right. I still can't even, I, I can't. 18 years old. But, but what I want mm-hmm. you to understand is <clears throat> Michael Brown in Ferguson was called a man by the AP. Right. This kid was called a boy. I want everybody to understand that. Um, Michael Brown, no matter what they say about who did what and how, didn't kill or hurt nobody. This this uh, man did, even though he's even though he's just eighteen, and they talk about the computer and radicalization. Um, I'm so sorry, Rivka, but I grew up in a country where, you know, we were still playing cowboys and Indians. What's mm-hmm. the object of cowboys and Indians to to, to commit genocide against native people? Some people might go, oh, that's taking it too far. No, it's not. No, it's no, not. that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. It isn't the Indians getting after the cowboys. We know exactly right. what the game of the game, I say in quotation marks, of cowboys and Indians is. That's right. So from a Jewish perspective, <clears throat> this, of course, does not support mipne dachei shalom um, for people to sort of exist in the world where we excuse that kind of, um, of um, craziness. So we... We're we're hurting, but we're also looking at this. You know, this a same number of people was was killed as in a tree of life in Pittsburgh shooting. So the idea here is that the, when they wow. talk about the great replacement theory, the the idea is that the Jews, the the, the you know the mysterious Jews, are causing um, they they're letting the floodgates of non whites in. They want to use black and brown people to sort of be weaponized against um, white. Um, hegemony, white uh, supremacy. And so this really does put a target on all Jews in North America, on on black people, on people of Latin descent, on Muslims, on um, South Asians, many, many groups, many, many groups. Uh, I haven't even begun to list them all out. We even had a recently a situation in Idaho where a state legislature member sponsored a, a press conference where two no neo Nazis said that they were going to bring guns to gay pride to br- and they said the words if they want a war we're going to bring the war to them. Oh God. So we are so pray for us and pray for our continued stability because this is there this is there this is an all out of assault on a multicultural North America. Yeah. And they know and they understand that, you know, if, if we're all gone tomorrow, God forbid, where are they going to get their culture from? <laughs> where are they, where they going to get their next song from? Where are they going to get their next athlete from? Where are they going to get their next hot dish that they want to appropriate from? Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, the bottom line is, okay, y'all, Jews gave you the weekend, so cut it out. You got to go back to working seven days a week. No, we we taking all the benefits back. Take we're everything taking, back. We're taking the Montreal we're taking bagels. Our spice. We're taking the spices. <laughs> there ain't gonna be no Caribbean food. No, all of it. All of it's got to go. Broadway's got to go. Hey, Musicals got to go. All of it. You know what? They don't even know the depth of it. Even the those things that saves lives, called the traffic lights, we're pulling them too. Yeah, because an yep. African American invented that. We're pulling that too. And I happen so to know. You're all gonna be crashing into each other. I happen to know his his granddaughter. Oh, yeah, look at that. She, she works she works at a university in yeah. Ohio, and uh, uh, Sandra Morgan, and she, I mean, I was like, whoa, and her family still has the prototype in the house. There you go. And wasn't it a Jewish woman who, um, <clears throat> wasn't it a Jewish woman who set it up? An actress. I'm going to get this wrong, but I thought she laid the foundation for Wi-Fi or something like that, or cellular or something like that. There's something. I'll have to look it up because I, you know, or maybe the audience can look it up and get back to me. But if they took us away, go ahead. Go ahead. See where you you go. We lose so many things. We lose so many things. Yeah. 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 And And the hatred is real. Like, you know, somebody was talking to me about it today just briefly and I guess uh, I said to I was numb I think I still kind of am Michael because Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. part of us too it's not that we've become 
I don't want to use the word desensitized, but we're we're getting used to it happening to us. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it, you, you're, we're not like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening. It feels more like, oh, it's been a while since the last time. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, and I'm just kind of like, I don't want to say I, I feel like I don't have hope, but you know, to those people who say, well, the new gen, the next generation is different and younger people are different and da, 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 18, 18, ain't nothing changing. Right. You know? So Right. It's not please. about the old generation dying off and yeah. we'll, we'll be free. And that's yeah. a very grim way to think about it. You know, um, one of the things that I feel that I've gained from, um, Torah is the idea that, you know, redemption is, is not a one-stop shop. It's a process. Shiva mm -hmm. is a process. And I think that um, it's a balance. It's a balancing act between accepting that people can make Shiva. They can change. And remember, um, you know, Shiva is also change a few things. And it's also the word we have for re to, to respond, the answer, to reply. Right. Um, so the idea is that people can change. People can self-redeem, but it's a very complicated, nuanced process that you okay. really have to, you really have to. So, Emir to Hashem, that people who feel this way, people who feel that need to sort of um, express their, their dislike, their distrust, their hatred, especially through violence, but not just violence of act, violence of words, violence of mm -hmm. words. Lashon hara, you know when I when I was, <laughs> you know here, here I, it rings in my brain. Um, Lashon hara, lamid hey, go to hell the easy way. <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm never gonna forget that. Right? Oh yes, hell yes. The so easy way. There it is. Go to hell the easy. That's why you were like an awesome Hebrew teacher. Things like that. Yep. <laughs> Oh, you know I'm going to be that. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm using it. I'm using yes. it. <laughs> Go to hell the easy way. Oh, my gosh. So from the vantage point you're at, being in the United States, how, I know it sounds so, eh, but how, how, how are people? Because we have our own perspective up here, but we're up here, right? Right. You know, it's, you, it's tough because, you know, we look at we look at Canada um, as sort of like the nicer us if we were nicer, <laughs> or, you know, that, you know, you know, that whole thing. And I know Canadians are definitely less like, well, but, you know, I've, I've been to Canada several times and yeah. <clears throat> been fortunate to be in, in your city of Toronto and Vancouver. Um, I actually have Canadian distant cousins because some of what? my people. Yeah, some of my people were like. Right after the Civil War, we're like, we getting hell up out of here. And they went to um, uh, Al Alberta, Br Alberta really? and British Columbia. Yep. And we're on the we're on the plains. And then uh, some of that family went to Toronto. And then I also have a, a group of really distant cousins that I think ran away from slavery during the revolution and made it to Nova Scotia. Ah, so what we fondly call Scotians. Yeah, I have a whole, I have a whole like you got a bunch of one side of country to the next side of country kind of thing. You need to make a trip where you just look for family. Yeah, that'd be that'd be cool. That'd be cool because I mean, to me, um, I actually when, the one question I didn't get answered, and I think it was because there was a little bit of antipathy towards talking to someone who's essentially a stranger, and that's me. Was I wanted to know how the food changed. Because I'm just looking to myself, y'all went from Alabama to mm -hmm. Alberta. <laughs> what, what, you know, what, what negotiations, what changes, what stayed the same, what, you know, all of that. Well, you know, all the spices dropped off. <laughs> they fell yeah, off the board. It's, it's, it's wild. It's wild. It's wild. Because, you know, it's, that's exactly what you know I work on is how food tells a story. I think a lot of people get kind of frustrated Sometimes, and they go, oh, well, you know, um, where's the recipe? Where's the how-to? Where's, how can I, yes, that's, that's not always the story. We are missing mm -hmm. the human stories behind food. 
we're missing the fact that a lot of a lot of what we a lot of how we do food tells us stories about each other. Right now, what I'm trying to figure out in answer to your question is how can we rework the food experience so that people understand, no, you can't be a Stephen Miller and go to a gourmet Mexican restaurant in Washington, D.C. and think that that's cool when you're persecuting the people, the very people mm -hmm. who this tradition comes from. And we're, and we're talking about, um, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Mexican cuisine is older than Jewish cuisine. I did not. 10,000 years old. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm even dating it oh. from, the, from the time of the domestication of corn. And that's, oh. and that's putting it, and that's putting it lightly. I mean, we're talking about um, the squash and the beans were there before. And so all the other crops and then the number of crops that came out of Mesoamerica, um, two thirds of the world's crops came from, right. you know, Mesoamerica that are grown today. And not just that, but you know, Mexico has an African heritage, a Spanish heritage, a Jewish mm -hmm. heritage, a Muslim, right. an Arab heritage, an indigenous heritage, a mestizo heritage, um, all sorts of influences from the Caribbean, but also from France as well. And so you have these regional cuisines. So we're talking about not reducing people to sort mm -hmm. of these these bubbles and boxes and understanding that okay if you're if you're so bold as to go to a spot and eat the food you should right. be so bold as to understand why these people share humanity with you and you share humanity with them cool cool you know it's funny you're saying food tells a story i actually also thought of something else hold on um it was kind of it was in relation to the rice and peas, actually. <laughs> you know, my obsession. But when, the first thing I, that struck me, it's not, it's not really in the vein of what you were saying, but it, was, it is in the vein of food tells a story. There's, or there's story behind food, right? That's mm -hmm. essentially. And, and I just thought, as soon as I think of rice and peas, I think of my dad, actually. Mm -hmm. I think of my dad because he made the best rice and peas. And um, I associate it with him uh, grating the coconut. I associate it with talking to him like while he's doing that and, and, and the, the beans and, and watching the process. And, you know, when I think of and part of me always wishes I could make it as good as he could. My mom made it, too, but my dad did it better. And I was always daddy's girl, <laughs> so, yes. you know, so I, I think of that. So, which is a good thing, which is a good thing. Yeah. Wow. Um, so before we started, we touched on something because, you know, your star, I don't even want to say it's rising, but it is. But I already think of you as like up here kind of thing. Like you're my guy. Like I love the fact. <laughs> that, I love the fact that when I hear Michael Tony, I'm like, you know, I know him. <laughs> you know, I know him. But with that, with comes stuff. And I yeah. know we were alluding to it, you know, because I'll be honest, I don't hang out much on Twitter anymore because I find it's a cesspool um, mm. and it makes me very edgy. And I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm getting too old to deal with that kind of BS. But um, I was just wondering, as you become more and more prominent, you know, doing your TV work, your books, your 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 speaking engagements, all that. Do you find it's like a double edged sword? I don't even know if that's the right term. Yes. Is it like yes. you know? <clears throat> yeah, because you know what people um, people vet you in ways that don't vet other people. Uh, I find it I find it incredible that um, you know I am I get it from all sides. You know, with Kosher Soul coming out, of course, I'm bracing myself for a lot of that. Because, okay, so you're black and you're Jewish. So you have black folks who immediately read you as an outpost of a political agenda that they may not agree with. 
I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep it as open as that. Um, or that Jewish means white. If you say Jewish, you mean white. But if you say Israelite or Hebrew, you mean black. Um, or that you may be trying to like sell um, religion to them, you know, as in you should be a Muslim or you should be Jewish or you should be this or you should be that because that's our original faith or we own this. I don't have any of those of those things going for me. Not at all. And on the other hand, you know, I unfortunately, it almost makes me want to cry. The number of people who in, you know, in the Jewish community and social media, and these are not mainstream people. These are fringe people. I'm going to make that very clear. These are fringe people who, um, but they're busy, who they, they, they don't want to hear anything about, you know, how I do Jewish or how long I've been Jewish or the fact that I've taught, you know, probably over a thousand students in the Jewish community that, that I've lived in and been a part of. Or these other, you know, mundane, basic, everyday parts, building blocks. The fact that, you know, I've traveled to Canada and to England, other places, Mm -hmm. talking about Jewish issues and and being Jewish. They don't care. All they want to know is, are you a hardliner? Are you a a hardliner? How? For 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 Israel. And I Ah. and I the thing about it is, is that I have a very complicated viewpoint that I don't express a lot because I don't want to get in people's nonsense. Um, I, I love Eretz Israel. I have been there twice. Um, I went on Birthright and I also went to participate in the Jerusalem Jewish Film Festival. Um, probably about, two, you know, 10 days at a time for each trip. Um, and I, but I am, of course, stunned at some of the things that we see as well. Um, but I can't, it's very hard for me because I have to talk as a North American. Um, I have to. I can't talk as somebody who has some immediate pass to both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. And it's and I say that because I I don't live there. I'm not an Israeli. I'm not a Palestinian. Mm-hmm. I'm not an Israeli Arab. I'm not a Druze. I'm not all these people who have a, who have a a stake, a dog in the fight. Right. Right. But right. I am frequently asked to <clears throat> condemn. Black Lives Matter, um, which, you know, to me, is two different things. It's the, it's the statement <clears throat> and it's the organization. Absolutely. And, and I don't have, and I'm not, like, really educated about the organization, to be honest with you. Um, but it's also asking me to, like, basically people will get in my DMs and say, you know, every time something happens in Medina Israel, they're like, why aren't you saying something? You know, basically, what good are you? Yeah. What good are you? If you're a black, yeah, I'm using their yeah. kind of mentality, and yeah, you're not, yeah, no. you're not, you're not yeah. a cheerleader for what we do. And I'm like, we, we, <laughs> who's this we? <laughs> who we, you know, you know, Beneno, come on now. <clears throat> and I, and yeah. I, and I, and, I, and, I'm, and you know, in, in the United States, <clears throat> that's far more, far more strong than Canada. Far more strong. It's like it's like a, you know, it's a test of your loyalty. And I'm just like, wait a minute. I'm sorry, but um, I have I have students who write me and say I still put on tefillin. That's my, that's my Jewish goal. I, I you know I I hate, yeah. to, I hate to I hate to put it to you, but but you know that I, I I've I've kept you know Jewish kids Jewish. That's my main goal in that's life. The, that that is the ultimate goal. So yeah, I, I, what, what do you what what do you want from me? But they don't yeah. want to hear about that, and that and it drives me crazy that I have to pass these purity tests on both sides. Yeah. I'll say one more thing, Rivka, and I want you to see if you can respond to this. Um, sure. You know, I've been in these colleges, and I get very. The last time I was at a college, um, um, I was down in New Orleans, and. I go to this like lunch meet and greet thing that I always have with students of color, especially if they're on primarily white institutions. And I got to tell you, there was this lunch thing, but it was kind of like it was so open ended that the kids kind of like the kids, the students, I shouldn't say kids, the students kind of like got their stuff and like sat around and rolled out. They really weren't staying for the thing as they were supposed to. And the person who was leading up the center or whatever, where I was spe- where I was going to do this little lunch and learn talk, um, she comes and she says, oh, yeah. Um, oh, yes, I know of you. you. 
you do the Jewish thing. So she's black, I'm black. And I said, yes, and I'm black first, thank you. I've always been black first. It's a Jewish thing. And, and yeah, and that's so you you know exactly what I read into that. Which is yep. you're an other. You're an other. You're yep. not really like us. You're not really one of us. You're not really speaking to anything that we need to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. That's there that's that's some that's some white people from wherever's stuff. That ain't our stuff. And it really it it it, it was such a simple statement. But given the fact that I've been to other campuses where Hillel will invite me and they'll invite Black Student Union or, or the black groups on campus, and they won't show up. Yeah. They think that I'm that there to, to me. yeah. They think that I'm there to, to you know, do you know, talk crud to them, whatever that crud may yeah. be, and it hurts. It hurts a lot because, um, you know, one one kid in this one kid in this uh, college in Pennsylvania, the two two brothers, one was from Africa, one was from America. They come to um, this thing I was doing. <clears throat> it happened to have been in the little shtibble that they had in the community. It was like old 1950s synagogue that was still being used. And nobody, it was no religion, there was no religious stuff going on. It was just a, a friendly dinner. The kids right. of different colors are there. <clears throat> but the kid gets up and he says, well, I gotta go. And he says, thanks for everything, I gotta go. So the other brother leaves with him. And he tells the professor who was sponsoring all this, I don't feel comfortable here. And I'm like, there's no, I mean, these are all extremely careful with their words, progressive students. Right. They were, there was no such thing as you're not welcome here. It was high, smiling faces, open arms. He, I think the issue was there was an Israeli flag. Of course, it's a synagogue. There's an Israeli flag uh-huh. in, the, in their building. And I just thought to myself, what kind of conversation do we need to have that people aren't afraid of flags. Exactly. Like, I don't know. You've had, you said you've had this experience before. Well, it's funny that you should say it because I really actually didn't even think about it, really process it until you said that when you said about Hillel and the Black Student Union, because I did have a presentation where they were presumably co-sponsoring, not presumably, they were, <laughs> but the black students didn't really show up. Mm-mm, mm-mm. No, and I never not. really thought about it till you said it. Like I obviously noticed, but obviously it's a thing. Yeah, it's a boycott. It's a boycott Dang. of these conversations. And here, you know, a couple, I will say this as quickly as I can. The, um, we had a whole argument about Aquafina, the comedian. And I told people, I said, you know, y'all are more in, y'all are more hot about her speaking with a so-called black scent <clears throat> than you are. We have other serious issues with the Asian American community that we need to work out. But I even mm-hmm. put a put a tweet out saying that, you know, black Americans and Asian Americans need to have a talk about our mutual histories, our conflicts our cooperations and really just have a ongoing dialogue. Hundred percent. I got a I got so much hate mail for that for one real? tweet. Yes. Basic and this is what they all came down to. One guy said, How dare you all uh, it's always someone like you offering an olive branch to the likes of them. To the likes of them? Yes. Referring to Asians and another, I mean, I got like 15 of these and another person said, I don't, I don't need to dialogue with somebody to, to, to um, get them out of any blackness. And so I would just, I said to her, I said, well, excuse me, but anti-black, you, you, you're telling me that all X number of East Asian human beings on earth are naturally anti-black or that's their default. I said, yes, I know anti-blackness is a huge global problem. But, yes, we know that. You, but you you are living here in the United States of America. You are living in a multicultural democracy. It is your responsibility <clears throat> to interact with people on the basis of them being a fellow citizen and a fellow human being. And if they have an issue, well, you, you don't have to you don't have to mess with them. You can tell them what was what and be gone. But right. you know, you mean to tell me that if if you see a an elder Asian American person being beaten up in the street. You're going to you're going to cross the street. Let them be. And let them yeah, be you're because let them be because they got an issue with anti-black. So to hell with them. Right, right. So what happens when it's your turn? 
Exactly. What happens when it's your turn? And so what I exactly. feel like what I feel like for Jews in this context is that I think people understand that you can punch at certain communities. You can punch. I mean, I, I basically tell about Aquafina, I said, you know, this accent thing doesn't really bother me because I grew up and I still live in proximity. People in my family, Asian Americans, who sound more, I don't know if you want to say black. I mean, of course, with both of us, <laughs> with you and me yeah. both, we both code switch. Yes. When you when we get agitated 100%. or we feel very yeah. comfortable, you speak patois, I speak A V. Yeah, man. And yeah. so I My patois is bad though. My patois oh. bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But you know but, uh-huh. yeah. But I do. I, I I code switch. Yeah. Right. But you know, I grew up with Asian Americans who when when you know, especially the generation that came over when I was younger, which is now forty years ago, you had choices. Mm-hmm. You could talk like white T V English. You could maintain your ethnic um, distinction, or you could you could sound the black and brown kids that you grew mm-hmm. up around. So her being yeah. from Queens, I'm like, uh, uh, Queens wasn't much what different from Baltimore, or DC, or Atlanta, where where you average Asian American kid grows up in a regular old neighborhood. They're gonna sound just like I'm talking now. Exactly. So, 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 so what, what are, what are we doing here? And what it, what it oh. means for us as, as Jews is this. People always talk about the black Jewish relations has, has gone down and it has, but here's the thing. If these folks are that, were that willing to say to me, to hell with them, I don't care. I, no tears lost. Well, what does that mean when it's Jews? What's the what's exactly. the conversation that's not happening? Also, because they because they can feel that may might get a certain type of pushback or response. Mm-hmm. It means that it's quiet as it's kept, which means it's a seething, passive aggressive, right? Anti-Semitism, which uh, yep. of, which of course for both of us there is that, but then there's also the seething, sometimes passive aggressive, sometimes very open anti-blackness we face from both ends yes. so that's why ends. i wrote kosher soul and i really wanted to you know to talk about us as people not as representatives of people's fantasies and you know imaginations you know what they think about what, what is a black person what is a jew you know of course i'm queer as well so that there's that i'm, I'm the triple threat right um <laughs> <laughs> In that way, okay, so this could sound really weird, but <laughs> I had this friend, and every time, actually, it was a friend and colleague, and every time it was time, you know, to do the pride parade and all that, I would say to him, I said, This is the only time of the year that you trump me. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Otherwise, because, you know, I said, I got the black thing going, I got the female thing going, I got the Jewish thing going, but this time of year, you trump me. <laughs> and he's like, I damn right I do. <laughs> so that's what that's what I thought of. You made me smile when you said that. The threat. Yeah, it's a threat of you know, it's it's you know, I somebody was like you know, said when I said this during a tweet or something like that, I said, Well, ah, oh, the, the triple threat of victimhood. I'm like, you you hear that and you hear victim. I hear I hear black, gay, and Jewish, and I hear survivor. I hear yeah, overcomer. Man. I yeah, hear man. I hear like creator of the culture that you enjoy, whether you hate me or not. Absolutely. I, you know, all of those things. All of oh, those things. Oh, because you know what, Michael? My mother used to say, three strikes. And you can say you got the same thing. You can call it three strikes if you wish, right? Yes. However, what the second part, the other part of that is you have three strikes. So you need to be three times better than everyone right. else. And That's that right. is what you strive for. That's right. I right? can't imagine if I was a woman. Mm. I'm already I'm already angry enough about how women's bodies, lives, and choices mm. are being used to um, manipulate policy, manipulate the world. People's, mm-hmm. you know, um, my sister-in-law... Um, had a had a had a, a situation that in the state of Missouri, they would have just said let her die. There you go. 
So I can't, I can't, I, I, if, if, but if I was a woman, I can't even imagine how much, and I hear, um, you know, Rabbi Sandra Lawson and other people talk about the experiences of being, you know, black, queer, Jewish, a woman, mm -hmm. and in leadership roles, how the struggle, people, people push you, people don't let you be your full self instead of them. And that's, I think that goes back to what we we're talking about before people, instead of people letting you flourish and be this, this outstanding opportunity to, to speak to so many things and bring such, bring new things to the world. They want to limit you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm just like, nah, nah, we're not going to do that. Um, Kosher Soul was really hard to write because it um, came to fruition during the Trump years, for one. Also, okay. it came to fruition during the year of Black Lives Matter. Wow. Um, you know, with George Floyd. And that's an international... I was going to say George Floyd. Yeah, international. Yeah. Inter an international thing. Because we were mm -hmm. all of our communities, Toronto, United, Washington, uh, London, Berlin, were responding. Paris. Mm -hmm. We're responding to very similar situations. Yes. With black people and law enforcement and tr and being contained in different different ways. I mean, not to return to the Buffalo thing, but here's the bottom line. That white boy is still alive. In okay. Grand, in okay. Grand Rapids, Put it out what? there. In Grand Rapids, Put Michigan, not that long ago, several weeks ago, um, a Congolese American was stopped by a cop. He freaked out because guess, where he, guess what? Where he comes from, cops are not just it's a thing yeah I, I i was in the ivory coast and stopped by cops which are more like military which kind of make you yes. your pants a little yeah mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. he got shot in the back of the head by the cop and the and the and the and the, the the video is so clear and so disturbing and you're thinking to yourself he didn't have a weapon on him he never committed a crime he had never been convicted of a crime he'd never been in jail he never seen a jail but this cop basically said pop in the back of the head it's it's it, it. I began to bawl immediately. But this kid has his life in front of him. I don't care oh if it God. is in the jail cell. So, Michael, really and truly, you know, the first thing once you once you get over the initial, dang, and you know as sure as you know the race of the shooter mm -hmm. without even looking if right. they were taken in alive. You know their you you immediately know their race, right. and. People, when, I remember when I used to say that out loud, and people would look at me and say, "Oh," and I say, "Really? Here you go. Start naming names." I start naming, sitting in car, reading books, sitting in, uh, and I said, "No weapon visible. No, this shot dead." I said, mm -hmm. "Somebody who is an," uh, with the excuse was, "I feared for my life," yet somebody actively, w with a weapon, with a weapon, clear danger. And they're taken in alive. If it's yep. him, the the because I don't want to I don't want to give their names air. This this dude, the guy who the sh church shooting, um, the 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 guy with recently with the protests and feared for his life, taken in with his weapon intact. Like don't don't feed me that stuff. Don't tell me it's not a pattern. Don't tell me subconscious, unconscious, bias. I don't care what you want to call it. Right. I call it fact. Yeah. It's like we don't we don't understand that these people can push back against systemic racism and, and implicit bias. It's not going to make it not a thing. It's exactly. It's not going to make it a lie. And that's the bottom line that we should. Because you're should, right. People do. On. They dig. They 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 double down on that issue. They double down on it and it's try like, and say, yeah, but but but. And I'm just like, do you know why, though? Do you know why? It's because they have been they have been taught by a renewed vigor among um, right wing extreme right wing extremists that this their power and their privilege as white folks to say, if, you know, it's, it's like these stories I would read from the time of slavery in America. And the worst ones are when a young person discovers it, that they are considered less than, they are not equals. And a lot, often, oftentimes the story will involve a, a, a plain fact. 
Like they're they're four they're four cows or the sky is blue or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they're being told, No, there's two. And then they get viol- violent reaction. And then they go, What 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 the hell just happened to me? Why are you hurting me? Why are you abusing me? Mm-hmm. Why are you telling me that what I'm seeing is not reality? Why are you gas you know, we would say gaslighting. Why are you gaslighting gas- me? Gas gaslight, yeah. Because I can. Yeah. And I will. Yeah. And I will do whatever yeah. it takes. Whatever it takes mm-hmm. to put you in your place and to preserve the future for my children over you because you don't matter. Don't you understand? And until mm-hmm. you confess that you are less than me, well, that's the thing mm-hmm. I will not do. I will not do. I will not confess that because if I confess that, why did God make me a human? Yeah. My Adam is not better than your Adam and your Adam is not better than my Adam. And if that is not the way we think, mm-hmm. that, is, that is the real Torah true Judaism. The idea that, you know, what we, what, we, what we have in this imperfect, ever perfecting, ladder climbing, scaling version of Jewish ethics and morals. You know, one of the things that I do at the very beginning of the book is I tackle Mashene um, Habriot, the blessing over differences. And the fact that some of the translations into English in the 50s, 60s, and 70s would say things like, if you see a hunchback, if you see a dwarf, if you see um, an albino, if you see an African or a Negro or a black. Mm -hmm. So wait a minute, hold up, hold up. If you see a Negro. (laughs) So I actually went into this. Ah, Sorry. sorry. Right? So I, but you know, (laughs) but people confront that, that text or other texts that are very problematic. And so first of all, the fact that in Judaism, we can do that. And we do do that. But also yeah. the idea that, you know, Chase Rishon, Rabbi Chase, um, he said to me, well, you don't have to translate this as a Negro, an African, or a Black. You can translate this as someone, if it says albinism, then there's uh-huh. melanism. We're not, we're not, we don't have melanism. We're just, you know, of African descent. We're, we have melanin. Right. That's all there is to it. But the people who are translating that that text are obviously showing their bias 100%. in how they see the world. And so they're yes. othering a black person, whereas we both know <clears throat> that they're Jew- Jews of all colors, but especially black and brown mm-hmm. before before the especially for the Roman times. Yeah, not only are they othering, and correct me if I'm wrong, it also feels like they're kind of putting us not just as others but a pitiful other like feel bad for these people because they're not as good as us well that's the i mean that's also the context of this particular bracha because it it basically is like this if you see somebody who is deformed or you see someone who is one one translation says the word retard and I'm just like, of course, to us, that's stunning. But in the language of 1960, whatever, even using the, that was, that was considered respectful. Yes. Against yes, saying, saying, words. Mongo, it meant, right. It just meant or other slow. terms. Yes. Slow. Yes. And someone yeah. who was, someone who was mentally, um, um, uh, of a certain, uh, a certain mental speed. Um, mm-hmm. and, it, and but also including people who who for whom that's not true. It's not about mental speed. It's just the fact that the, the, the way they're received by society. I say that to say yeah. that the whole bracha is there because it's about pity. Pity. It's about going from pity to lifting up God's name because God knows best. But that's the thing. The chapter is called "A Blessing on Strange Creatures." How do I bless myself? Do I look? Do I have to look in the mirror and say the phrase? Thing, you, see you know, as a strange creature. Creature, right? Do I do that or <laughs> see yourself do I, as a strange creature? Okay, so do, there are some days I'm looking pretty raggedy, but I still wouldn't well, say I'm a strange, I'm a strange creature. creature. <laughs> and, even, and, and, and that word, that word, creature, right? Creature. That's, 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 that's fighting words. You know, you know it. So I mean, <laughs> you know, it goes. I guess I should go to the food part real quick because people get mad at me. 
Um, oh, I, the, yeah, you know what? I'm going to get the, the comments. Um, excuse me, but I thought it was supposed to be about food. I had a, I had a knockdown. I had a knockdown drag out with somebody. I did a thing for the Israeli embassy uh, virtual. And someone got really hot in the Q&A and was really hammering on that exact thing. Because we were talking about, the person interviewing me was really great, but she was willing to talk about issues of appropriation, issues of, you know, um, access, etc. And it was just like, I came here for him to teach me some 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 stills some skills I can steal right and Eat I'm like recipes I put it I, oh <laughs> honey I put it right back on him and I was like nah I was like yes I mean I mean I can write about that but what I want people to understand is <clears throat> the sixty plus recipes that are in this book which I never intended to be a a bible of Black Jewish cooking um I don't I know I don't I'm not even sure necessarily that I could do that without being extremely arrogant because there's so many different black Jewish voices, Ugandan ones and Canadian ones and British ones and South African ones, Caribbean ones. And I, I don't, I don't think that there is, as no way that I could, you know, that I, I, well, I wanted to do that originally, but I was like, there are so many histories and so many stories and so many complications right. that I don't, I can't do it justice. And, and still I want to talk about my own journey and journeys like yours and talk about their people's roots and how they how they fit into this matrix. And it's like I said before, it was so hard to write this book because I'm in the middle of all this social um, sturm und drang. And you don't just kind of like scrape off the other parts to get to the good stuff. It's not like, you know, eating burnt toast, right? You know, it doesn't matter how much butter you put on it and how much jam, it's still burnt it's still toast. Burnt. Still so, nasty. Still nasty. So, so what you got to do is look at it and go, okay, I can't tell all the stories, but I can definitely tell my story. And I can definitely give people an insight into what this means with people of color in particular. I think people need to understand something. As people of color in, in, in Western societies where we're not the majority, <clears throat> the kitchen is a special place of healing. And communication it's where we we go to that kitchen table with all of, all of our joys successes but also our hurts our failures and our struggles and we use that space to tell our, tell each other stories about where we've been and where we're gonna go and I would be remiss if I sat up there and said well I'm gonna give you everything but the burnt Everything but the burnt. I'm gonna scrape it off for you a little bit to clean it up, but I'm gonna give you. But I'm not gonna give you the burnt, and you'll never know that it existed. So I want people to really you hear that. Right? The burnt toast, right? I, listen, I want people to really think about what it would be like if we presented, say, for example, Eastern European Jewish history as the show. I never happened. The pogroms never happened. The Crusades never happened. That's you can't. The the Romans never happened. You it's can't imp- separate it. No, it's impossible. No, it's but, impossible. but 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 why should we separate it to make people yeah. feel good or feel better when they can yeah. just feel appreciation for how much it took to get these recipes to the table and to have a conversation with each other about their human story? That's all I want to do. I want I want us to be um, normalized. I want the fact that we walk in the door with. Things people have said to us, experiences we've had. I talk. I do talk a lot about some some positive experiences that I've had, and I I do give the community a lot of credit for, you know, being an alternative space. I'll, I'll put it like this: an alternative space of embrace. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. it's very different. I don't think people understand like what it's like when you have those moments where you're just like you walk in. And you're already anticipating like Drek. And mm-hmm. you, and what you get is this, hey, you need a ride somewhere? What? Strange white lady can give me a ride? <laughs> what? For real? And she drops me to the synagogue and says, yes. She didn't just clutch her purse and run no. to the other side? <laughs> or when, you know, group there was a group of uh 
Mizrahim yeah. from Israel. They were they were they were you know there were a lot a lot of the community in, in Maryland, um, and so they they see me out in the rain getting drenched, and they see the kippa and the sisters, and they were not religious, and they just they opened the door and said, "Get in, come on with us," and it, it, so. It, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's those like, moments. It's those moments that that give you this understanding that yes, the world can be hostile, but guess what? The yep. world can also be a place where you can find mishpacha. Absolutely, and I think I hear, I so hear what you're saying because often too we get sucked into. I I like to call it the good, the bad, and the ugly, mm. and there are so many times that we we do get get caught up and sucked into the what is bad, what is ugly, about navigating through the community, etc. And not recognizing moments like the white lady who, you know, in the car. Or mm-hmm. recognizing, you know, that I had some of the best moments in Israel. Recognizing I have great moments here where mm-hmm. um, the community has embraced me and protected me. And, right. you know, it's 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 more it's more than just that experience or that experience it's, it's more than just the traumas exactly exactly right. and right. that's really important because if you do forget that it's if you do forget that then in some ways you end up wallowing in the trauma right if that makes any sense right right and the recipes are part of the joy process um um, one person I know, Native American, said to me that the antidote to the traumas of our ancestors is taking joy in our culture. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I want to give a shout out to Rivka because Rivka's Jamaican rice and peas has a starring role in the recipe <laughs> section. And just like, I think I quote you somewhere else talking about, you know, having Bami for the... um for oh, um, yes. the Caribbean Seder plate, et cetera. And I'm just, yeah. this is, so but yeah, like I said, I, I want people to use my writing, my work as a blueprint for their own sort of exploration. I mean, I, I did a whole masterclass on this, but I want anybody of any background to be able to say, okay, the, the, the creative pieces are in my hands. So, you know, the big question for us is how do we not other black food as Jewish food. Well, we cook it, we serve it, we eat it, we share it, we talk about, <clears throat> you know, um, I think a crock pot of, of, of rice and peas is, is, you know, maybe our chillant. It's, you know, being able to see that so yeah. many of these things have, you know, we, 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 can, we can turn them into elements. You know, I, I just donated. Absolutely. Uh, oxtail. Yeah. Make some oxtail, oxtail stew. Like, right. There it is. Right there, in the, it is in the, in the slow cooker. And there, mm-hmm. and, and and of course, the people. What people don't understand is, I should probably say this to you before we run out of time, is that when I talk, when I do the chapters where it talks about the evolution of kosher soul on American shores, I have to talk about the Caribbean and the complexities there. And so, like people don't think about Eskovich and other 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 stuff that has yeah. these roots in both diasporas. Yeah. And it's very deep because, like in Suriname, like they still use the word treif. Treif. They say ah, treif. They chop treif. So, so that's ah, right. Yeah. All these understandings that yeah. we have. So, where does that come from? What is this? I mean, we're talking about Brazil, Cuba, Suriname, Jamaica, Trinidad, Tobago, Barbados, all these stories. And then, then some of these stories get, get um, brought to the American South. Mm-hmm. And beyond. And so I ask questions like, all right, if you were enslaved and you were uh, working for a, a Jewish merchant in Norfolk, Virginia, which actually happened, how do you navigate Kashrut? So, you know, for example, he buys uh, crabs and oysters for the servants, which tells you he's at that point in his family's generations. They're keeping kosher in the kitchen, but the the other food is for the black folks. Right. Okay. Yes. So in Suriname, they were calling that blackfish. Shrimp oh. and crab and oyster were called black people's fish, and they called a bukra fish. 
the kosher, kosher fish. fish. So yeah. that's fat, right? Isn't that fascinating? Because, wow. but but the thing about it is, we don't have volumes of people's lives. That's what I said before. It's not just the recipe, guys. It's the story behind people's mm-hmm. lives. So the mm-hmm. very fact that I don't have that, that we don't have that, means that I have to now take as a scholar of food history the little mm-hmm. bits and pieces, take everything that we know, and try to reconstruct that mosaic so that we can actually begin to see a picture, the outline of what was once a lived everyday experience. Um, and of course, that your recipe and others are a part of the contemporary part where we talk about how, you know, um, uh, Tikva in Baltimore makes kosher crab cakes, you know, <laughs> you know, using salmon and ser- kosher surimi and other stuff and a lot of Old Bay. Nice. And how so and so, um, I talked to white Protestant converts to Judaism from the South. And it was fascinating to me was how black Jewish folks of different backgrounds, these white Jewish these white converts to Judaism from Southern evangelical religion, and black Muslim chefs all had the same sort of questions and interactions around food and also were dead all dedicated to maintaining those deep cultural links and so i'm just like y'all are sitting around looking for what brings us together what binds us what gives us common ground and i'm just looking at it going wow the white folks from the south Uh the black muslims and the black jews have the same sort of thing going on isn't that something yeah yeah wow we family we cousins yeah you know i hate i hate i hate to i hate to burst your bubble because like you know i'm (laughs) i'm a i'm a i'm a one sixteenth trini but you know we can't all be perfect what's (laughs) it I love it. Because remember when you found out that? And I was like, dang, I was hoping it would have come out Jamaican. And you were you were you were like oh, yeah, one of Trini. Twenty people who were just like Tree Team Trini. Why not Team Jamaica? A team Jamaica man. <laughs> team Trini. Team Jamaica man. Cha. <laughs> Cha. <laughs> oh, oh, you know, I never thought about that. I never thought about that. In Patwa Cha. In PG in Jamaica in, in Nigeria, che, che, che. There's a, like everything, oh, che. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Jamaicans, cha, cha man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Uh, even though I'm kind of a Jamaican, I still hang on to some stuff. Yep, I still, I'm still, re- I'm still reflecting on our code switching, man. Because not too many people get it. I had to explain it the other day to someone. I had to explain what code switching was. And I said, we do it. You don't even know that I do it because right. I would present a certain way when I'm with you. You know what I mean? I was saying this person. So you don't know. And sometimes know. It's, I, I say it's being, I say, think of it this way. The old 1950s thing about being a, a, a Jew at home with a man on the street. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because it's funny, yeah. you know, we're recording this. Turn off the recording, we switch back. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right, we're right. Being, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, and we do it so intuitively. And it's something right. that I remember of always having done. I can't remember not doing that. My kids do it because I've, I guess they instinctively, they pick it up and they know mm-hmm. we got to do this. But I love... I love the fact I'm going to switch tax again. I just love what you do and just bringing a different element to food, making it more than just something that I eat, something that keeps me from not being hungry or keeps me from not passing out. Right. Just really recognizing how much there is about food, because I think to some degree we get it, but we don't really get it. And you're, showing us, teaching us, guiding us, and you're continuing to to build up our knowledge around food and food history and how much it means as people and the tie-in with that. Right. And I think that I can't wait 
Not just because my name's in the book. Okay, that's part of it. <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> I have no shame. I can't. I, I can't wait. I can't wait for the book. And the title, I think I've known you not just as Michael Twitty, but I think I've known you as Kosher so forever. Right. Right. right? right. So it's, it's great that it, it feels like, I don't feel like you didn't use like <clears throat> that kosher soul the name was gone but i feel like it's it's revitalized again so yes. i think it's awesome well remember it almost got stolen from me well way back when because there was oh a, you need to you need the, to spill yeah there was a reality show oh that's right right kosher soul and was and it, right. the reason why we were so incensed um was mm -hmm. because it was it was obviously exploitative it was some, some some brother who was in the music scene and they loved it. They they, they just salivated over those mm -hmm. moments where he encountered Jewish practice and said dumb things or looked like he'd never heard of and I'm just like mm -hmm. um y'all, this is not the history. This is not the experience. Step and fetch it. Step and fetch Sorry. it kind of stuff, exactly. <laughs> it was very coonish. It was it was very mm -hmm. Tomish. It wasn't and then of course yep. she was she for her part was the quintessential Jewish American princess archetype. Um mm -hmm. and it just it just it just looked like there was a whole thing about him passing out to get his how to fight dumb breed. Distasteful. And I'm just like, this isn't cool. This isn't cool at all. It isn't warm yeah. and funny and nice. And by the way, not one, not one Jew of color was on anything that I saw. I think the show just banned after three, four episodes. They even yeah, get to I, the... I remember it as a blink. You had to remind me about it. Right, right. Yeah. But they, but they were like, but they totally, they totally like nabbed it, re, re, reminded everybody, trademark your stuff. Yes, man. Because I, when I think kosher soul, I think you. Right. And I should, and you can't have anybody make dirtying it up, muddying it up with their crap. right, their nonsense. So, yeah. mm -mm, mm -hmm. mm -mm. so we 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 have so many stories left to tell, and that's one thing I want to just impress upon everybody is that just because, just because. Someone like me has done this, done a book like this or project like this, does not mean in any way, shape, or form that you cannot do your own. We have so many stories to tell, so many voices to amplify. Please do not wait on ceremony. Find a way, book, album, podcast, uh, whatever the product may be, um, graphic novel, I don't care what it is, song. <laughs> Find a way to tell you and your people's story in a way that will be unforgettable. Do it now. Oh, Don't gosh. wait on ceremony. Do it. Oh, on that note, thank you so much, Michael. No, thank you. You've always I gotta been a light. Come. I, I, oh, you're my guy. I'm telling you. I'm <laughs> telling you. Huge soft spot for you. Like, I think of you as like my brother. And I need to see you again. So yes. now that the borders are opened up, yes. and I think I still have some Porter Airline fl uh, points, so maybe I yes. need to use them. And this time, I come to you. Heard that. But also, I, am, I'm, I have a strong intention to come back to Toronto this okay. year. So I will let you know when, and we're going to make it happen. But either way, you're yes. always welcome here. You're always welcome here at my um, lovely southern home. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna take you up on it. Yes, ma'am. You might have to like. You might be like, she she ain't leaving. <laughs> <laughs> How do I get her out? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, thank you so much. No, thank oh, you. Oh gosh. Yeah, we'll touch base again. Absolutely. Shalom. Thanks for listening to Riv Koosh. Our producer is Michael Freeman. Music by Westside Gravy and I am Riv Koosh. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can hear more at the cjn.ca slash Riv and support us by subscribing. If you want to support the CJN, join the CJN Circle. You get quarterly magazines, invitations to live events, and a weekly printable edition. Learn more at the cjn.ca slash circle. Thanks for listening.